Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Andika and I will be your moderator from this for this morning lecture. To honorable Professor Madya Dr. Musawiati Mustafa. Prof Musa, thank you for your time. The honorable dean and vice dean of Faculty of Medicine di Pondokoro University. The Honorable Head of Medical Department, Faculty of Medicine, Diponegoro University. The Honorable Head of Medical Doctor, Profession Education Study Program. The Head of Ophthalmology yeah. Division. Faculty of Medicine. Medicine. Uh, thank you for your attendance this morning. We have a special guest from University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Professor Musa. Good morning, Dr. Musa. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is a uh, veteran of ophthalmologist, and today uh, Dr. Musa will be covering the current concept management of diabetic retinopathy, and also. Uh, the second speaker, Dr. Ali Fildan, will discuss the clinical and auxiliary retinal examination in diabetic retinopathy. Okay. Uh, maybe before we begin, an opening statement from Dean of Diponegoro University, represented by Dr. Dr. Trilaksana Nugroho, Spesialis Mata Konsultan. Please, Dr. Tri. Thank you, Dr. Andika. Good morning, all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrafil anbiya wa mursalin. Wa ala li wa sobi ajmain amma ba'du. Your Excellency and Honorable, our guest speakers, uh, Professor Madya Dr. Mushawiyati Mustafa from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Good morning, Prof. Uh, our domestic speakers, uh, also Chief of Ophthalmology Specialist Program, my colleague, Dr. Arif Hildan, MSE Med, SPM Consultant from Department of Ophthalmology FK Audit, uh, Chief and Secretary of Medical Profession Study Program FK Audit, Dr. Helmia Farida MKS, SPA PhD, and Dr. Julian Dewantiningrum, MSE Med SPOK Consultant. And then Chief of Department of Ophthalmology, FK Undip, Dr. Maharani Cahyono, SPM Consultant. Uh, dear lecturers and medical staff of Ophthalmology Department, FK Undip, Rumah Sakit Dr. Karyadi, RSDK, and Rumah Sakit Nasional di Ponegoro. RSND, and of course, my beloved brothers and sisters, dear student, co-assistant, and residents of ophthalmology specialist program. First of all, I would like to confirm that Mr. Dean was unable to attend in this virtual lecture, and I replace him to give a speech and open the event. Uh, and secondly, I would like to welcome uh, Prof. Madia, Dr. Mushawiyahti Mustafa, in this virtual guest lecture forum. And we very thanks to Prof. Mustafa for taking your time, especially during the long pandemic periods, Prof., to share knowledge and your experiences with us in the most challenging cases of retinal diseases, diabetic retinopathy. 
and as we know the diabetic retinopathy has a high prevalence and still a most frequent and challenging cases in VR impairment and also the visual outcome of DR is still a big problem in our community uh, even though the cataract and refractive errors are still the most frequent case causes visual impairment and blindness the DR will slowly but surely follows as the most common causes of visual impairment and blindness besides cataract and refractive errors along with the increasing of life expectancy and modern lifestyle recently. Mm, and in RSDK and also RSND, the diabetic retinopathy is the most cases and the most eye surgery. Not to mention neglected cases in the community that uh, were not handled or referred to the hospital. I think for this reason, a good knowledge and understanding of the art is needed, starting from the aspect of healthy promotion, prevention, management, and rehabilitation of the art to achieve the best outcome so that the patient quality of life is also better. Furthermore, I would like to say thank you for the entire committee for their hard efforts in organizing this lecture. And finally, please allow me to open the events by saying basmalah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hereby, the guest lecture with the topic of the current concept of management of diabetic retinopathy is officially opened. That's all my opening speech. Thank you for your kind attention. Have a nice lecture, stay safe, and stay healthy. Bila hitau fit wal gidayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tri, uh, for the opening speech from this lecture. Uh, You're ready? welcome. Before Prof. Musa Musa lecture, we begin with Dr. Arif first to present uh, the topic. Yeah. Dr. Arif will discuss about the clinical and auxiliary retinal examination in diabetic retinopathy. Okay. Uh, please, Dr. Arif, the time is yours. Uh, can you hear our my voice? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, selamat pagi. Um, today I would like to present the introduction of the diabetic retinopathy and then after me, uh, our guest speaker will extend more information about the current concept and the management of the diabetic retinopathy. Okay, slide. This is, these are our reference to make the presentation. I hope this is enough. And this is the outline. Uh, we will talk about the prevalent history taking, clinical examination, and auxiliary examination, such as fundus fluorescent angiography, OCT, and OCTA. As we know that um, diabetic retinopathy now is the primary cause of the vision loss in adult age 20 to 74 years, we can see here about 1.06% of blindness in the worldwide could be attributed by diabetic retinopathy. So we can see from this the huge number of blindness caused by diabetic retinopathy. So 
we think we have to learn more about this disease more carefully and more precisely. The first, <clears throat> uh, when we meet the patient, we have to find out uh, is there any efficient complaint for the diabetic patient because maybe in the type 2 diabetes, maybe we are the first doctor that can uh, make a diagnosis of diabetes mellitus because uh, the only symptom may be a deficient declining. So uh, it's very important for us to know about the vision to our patient. And the second one is the duration of diabetes. The type 1 diabetes uh, in 15 years, almost all the patient will suffering with the diabetic retinopathy and the type 1 diabetes is more severe than the type 2. And also we have to find out the comorbidity which is uh, can we find in the diabetes mellitus patient like uh, hypertension. You know, we know that hypertension can make the diabetic retinopathy worsen and kidney disease, hyperlipidemia, ischemic heart disease. We have to find out this data from the patient, including pregnancy because the pregnancy can make the diabetic retinopathy more aggressive. And the other thing we have to find out the ocular history of the patient such as the previous laser or eye surgery because we know that the patient with the eye surgery previously uh, they will break down the blood retinal barrier and then will make the eye more uh, more progression of the diabetic retinopathy and also the glaucoma because the patient can have the neovascular glaucoma from the diabetic retinopathy. We have to know the family history about the blindness of amputation because of diabetic uh, mellitus and kidney dialysis too. In this slide, we can see that the primary risk factor of development of diabetic retinopathy is the duration of diabetes. We can see here if the patient suffering the diabetes mellitus uh, below 10 years, is uh, the risk is 21.1% will develop diabetic retinopathy. And if after 20 years, it increasing about 76.3% diabetic retinopathy. And we can see too about the HB1AC level. If the AC1, HB1C level is below 7%, the risk of diabetic retinopathy is 18%. And if, if over the 9.1%, uh, the risk will increase until 51.2%. And we can see here the blood pressure also. The higher the blood pressure, the higher risk factor to become uh, to have a diabetic retinopathy. And the uh, ASEAN race uh, ethnic is a uh, lower risk compared to the African American. Uh, to develop the diabetic retinopathy. In clinical examination, the first thing that we have to examine the patient is the visual acuity. If we find the patient with the visual acuity 20 over 40 or better, that means the patient have a good visual acuity and they can still do daily living activity and driving car safely. But we find the, if we find the patient with uh, visual acuity 20 over 40 until 20 over 60, maybe the patient has already had a macro edema. So we have to be careful to this patient. And if we find the patient with the visual acuity 20 over 200 or worse, which is, is already become a legal blindness, maybe the patient has the proliferative uh, diabetic retinopathy. As we know that the cause of the visual declining in the diabetic retinopathy is because of macular edema and the complication of the neovascularization such as the vitreous hemorrhage and uh, from the tractional retinal detachment. So we have to find out this because this is the cause of the visual declining. And then we move on to the anterior segment lens examination. First, 
we have to examine or measure the intraocular pressure. In intraocular pressure, we have to know how high the intraocular pressure of the patient because sometimes patient will develop neovascular glaucoma, which is very devastating and very dangerous situation. So we have to to do the IOP measurement for the first time. And then the cornea, the normally cornea is clear, but because of the metabolic disturbance of the cornea, because of the diabetic it can have a desmet fault. In the anterior chamber, we have to find if there are any cell and flare. It may be because of the rubiosis and also maybe because of the recent PRP that previously done to the patient. In iris, we have to find out is there any rubiosis iridis or atrophy in iris. We know that rubiosis iridis in iris is the sign of how ischemic the retina is because the more ischemic retina, maybe a rubiosis iridis will develop. And after that, they will grow to the angle and make the neovascular glaucoma. So it's very uh, important sign that we have to find out from the patient. And from the pupil, the inability to contract properly because uh, if the retina damage is huge area, maybe the pupil is uh, being damaged too. I mean, the effect to the pupillary contracted because we know the sensory sensory uh, area of the pupil is the from the retina, the reflect pupillary uh, uh, is from the retina. And the lens, we can see if the patient with diabetic, we have to find out is there any cataract because the lens uh, become cataract earlier in the diabetic patient, especially in the type one diabetic. And then we move on to the posterior segment examination. We can use slit lamp with the condensing lens with uh, 78 dioptery or 90 dioptery. We can see the retina from the posterior segment to the peripheral area. And we can also use the Goldman tree mirror, so we can examine the more peripheral of the retina. And also we can use the indirect ophthalmoscope with the 20 diopter uh, lens. And for the medical student or general practitioner, maybe uh, you can use a direct ophthalmoscope also, but because of this uh, equipment is narrow field and lack of stereoscopies, you have to move your ophthalmoscope around the retina to have an information about the retinal condition. So it's a little bit difficult, but still can to make a diagnosis of the diabetic retinopathy. This is the international classification of uh, diabetic retinopathy. They divide into two <clears throat> uh, principles. The first one is uh, non-proliferative and the other one is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. The difference is the neovascularization. If the patient had already had a neovascularization, that means it's, uh, the staging is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. If they don't have, or haven't had a neovascularization, the staging is about the non-proliferative. And we can see here, if we can only find macroaneurysm, this one is a mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. And if we find interretina hemorrhage in every quadrant, and if we find the venous bleeding in two quadrants or inter Irma interretinal microvascular abnormality in one quadrant. This is the severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. In every stage of diabetic retinopathy, it will develop diabetic macular edema. So also we have to examine macular area to to find out whether there is a macular edema or not. This is the. Um, fundus photograph, we can see from here. This one is a microaneurysm. So 
in this patient, because there is only microaneurysm we find, this is the mild uh, NPDR, and then this one is severe NPDR. We can see that there is a hemorrhage in, in every quadrant, and uh, you can see the blood hemorrhage here, blood hemorrhage, and then dot hemorrhage, and the macular edema. In between this, there is a staging of moderate NPDR. In proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we will find the neovascularization. Neovascularization is the growing abnormal vessel, which is an uh, incomplete structure of the vessel. So it can leak, it can bleed, it can make a traction to the retina. So the complication of the neovascularization, such as vitreous hemorrhage and traction retinopathy detachment, can develop in the proliferative diabetic retinopathy. We can see this the abnormal vessel growing elsewhere in the retina and this one on the disc. We move on to the fundus fluorescent angiography. Yeah, we use the sodium fluorescent, 10%, five milliliter. And because of only 20%, circulated unbound within the vasculator and diffuse into tissue we can it can be visualized by a specific camera so we can see here that the fluorescein is not leaked from the vessel because the uh, molecular weight is is uh, is cannot uh, extracted from the vessel so in the normal condition there is no leak from the fluorescein into the retina or outside the uh, vessel. This is the normal phase, the sixth phase of the fluorescein angiogram. We can see from here, this is the colloidal phase, arterial phase, retinal arterial filling, and then venous lamellar, and then venous filling, and then recirculation, and then the late phase. We can see from here, there is no leak. It is the normal normogram because the fluorescein is still inside the vessel. In non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, we will find out the leaking microaneurysm and maybe the some focal ischemic area. We can see from here this is the leaking microaneurysm in the area of macula. In the proliferative diabetic retinopathy, fundus fluorescein angiography will discover the leakage from the neovascularization. You can see from this, the neovascularization from the disc, and then in the late phase, they will leak it from the neovascularization. So this uh, examination is very important to us to know that whether there is a neovascularization or not. And we move on again to the another equipment, is the ocular coherence tomography. It is a machine, it can take the cross-sectional picture of the retina and then we can evaluate the health and the thickness of the retina. This is the normal retina anatomy in OCT. We can see the layer by layer in the optical, uh, optical image here. This is not the histopathologic, but this is optical, but the image is uh, uh, similar maybe the with the histopathologic layer. we can see the layer by layer in the retina from the internal limiting membrane until the RPE this is the normal condition of the retina the foveal um, contour is concave like this and then this is the beauty of the OCT in the diabetic retinopathy we will find the intraretinal fluid with this uh, fluid inside the neurosensory retina or even in the subretinal fluid like this. And some of microaneurysm, maybe it's a little bit difficult to find out the microaneurysm. Sometimes we have to have the fundoscopy image so we can uh, see whether what is it, maybe, yeah, because, yeah, maybe this is a microaneurysm or something we have to prove it in the fundus photograph. And also this one, the hyperreflectivity inside the neurosensory retina, maybe this is hard exudate. If we, if we don't have any uh, fundus picture, 
we cannot see this is a heart exudate or blood maybe because the hyperactivity can uh, cause can uh, be caused by uh, hemorrhage or heart exudate and this is the neovascularization uh, by using OCT we can see the retinal neovascularization as we know that neovascularization is the growing vessel uh, beyond the retina and then goes to the vitreous so if the if there is an image like this so this is the vessel already grow outside the retina and this is the retinal neovascularization in the retina and this one from the OCT we can see the neovascularization on the disc and uh, the other things that we can find from the OCT is the tractional retinal detachment as we know that tractional retinal detachment or retinal detachment is the detached retina from the RPE we can see here this is the retina and this is the RPE so the retina detached because of the pulling of the uh, fibrovascular membrane so the retina is uh, detached you can see from here there this is RPE this is the retina okay and we move on to the OCT angiography uh, the difference between the fluorescent angiography and OCT angiography we don't need the fluorescent uh, fluorescent that we have to inject to the vessel but the OCT can uh, detect the movement of the blood cell and then they generate the angiogram is uh, similar or with the fluorescent angiography we can see from here the vessel because they can analyze the movement of the red blood cell and then they make a, a continuing photograph and then make a look like a vessel from here and from this OCT angiography we can see the microaneurysm it will be a little bit difficult for us because this is still a new machine so if we only find this we don't know yet what is it because uh, very difficult to to detect what is it if we if we find I mean if we have the uh, FFA we can you know uh, make a uh, improvement oh yeah maybe this is the microaneurysm because almost all the vessel is the same you know structure so we have to have the more uh, precisely to see what is this because the the anatomic of the vessel is almost the same we have to learn more about this maybe Dr. or Prof. Musa will explain more about this because this is the new machine that we still have uh, and then this one is the comparison between the staging of the diabetic retinopathy we can see this is the normal vasculature and this is the NPDR we can see the vascular zone is uh, bigger comparing to the normal condition and in the PDR the flow the fovea vascular zone is more larger than uh, NPDR this one uh, show us this there is uh, macular ischemia macular ischemia is a condition that macula is already being ischemic in this very severe condition and in OCT angiography we can uh, see the neovascularization in the vitreous segment because normally in vitreous there is no a vessel if you find the structure like vessel in the vitreous yes maybe this one is uh, neovascularization so in this one in this uh, this on top of the disc and in the OCT we can see that uh, neovascularization above the disc yes this is the retinal neovascularization as I told before it's a little bit difficult to find what is it is it a real neovascularization or not maybe we have to have the B scan OCT 
to prove if the vessel is outside the retina. Yes, maybe it's proof is a uh, neovascularization, but still we uh, have to learn more about this equipment. In summary, diabetic retinopathy is a devastating disease if left untreated and clinical examination may help doctor to make a proper diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. And the proper diagnosis is needed to do an accurate management of diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. I think uh, this is all my presentation. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ari, for your presentation. I think this is an interesting presentation. Okay. Uh, maybe, uh, I'm sorry, I will conduct for <coughs> this session compared with in English and in Bahasa. Uh, di sini ada teman-teman dari mahasiswa profesi dokter dan juga residen ya. Jadi memang untuk retinopati diabetika ini suatu kasus yang trennya naik ya di samping katarak dan kontrafraksi karena kita tahu bahwa penyakit metabolik juga trennya semakin tinggi gitu. Sehingga di sini Dr. Arif menjelaskan mengenai beberapa tanda klinis ya dan beberapa modalitas penunjang yang bisa kita lakukan. Untuk teman-teman mahasiswa profesi dokter, ini penting sekali untuk mengetahui tanda-tanda klinis dari retinopati diabetes ya, karena kompetensinya dokter umum yaitu bisa menilai ya suatu kelainan fundoskopi ya, sehingga harapannya dengan bisa menilai itu bisa menemukan kasus lebih cepat sehingga penanganannya nanti akan lebih apa namanya akan lebih mudah gitu ya, tidak terjadi progresivitas penyakit yang lebih berat begitu, sehingga ini penting sekali untuk teman-teman uh, maestro profesi dokter koas ya untuk belajar pemeriksaan fundoskopi ya fundoskopi direct minimal bisa melakukan sehingga apa namanya penemuan penemuan kasus yang lebih cepat ya penanganan yang lebih uh, cepat ya sehingga tidak terjadi progresif penyakit yang lebih berat kalau sudah lebih berat penanganan akan lebih sulit ya kemungkinan juga bisa terjadi kebutaan yang permanen begitu juga pada teman-teman residen di sini ya karena untuk uh, diabetes retinopati ini untuk manajemennya ya ada beberapa modalitas manajemen nanti akan disampaikan oleh Prof Pusa ya teman-teman uh, residen di sini nantinya kan akan menjadi dokter mata umum ya di mana sebetulnya kompetensi injeksi intravitreal di VGF dan juga laser fotokabulasi jadi kompetensinya sehingga tadi disampaikan dokter Arif beberapa modalitas penunjang itu penting sekali untuk dipahami oleh teman-teman residen ya seperti, seperti OCT ya apa namanya yang sifatnya non invasif dilakukan berulang kali bisa melihat struktur retina lebih jelas ya kelainan letaknya di mana itu teman-teman uh, residen harus bisa uh, mengetahui itu dan juga nanti kita akan melihat ya manajemen diabetes ketinopati dari Prof Musa gitu kira-kira seperti apa yang komprehensif gitu karena uh, apa namanya harapannya nanti teman-teman uh, residen sebagai dokter mata umum ya bisa me melakukan penanganan ya, tadi jika jika memang diindikasikan dilakukan injeksi intravitra anti VGF ataupun laser fotokoagulasi gitu. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, the next uh, our guest lecture, yeah. uh, Professor Musa, the time is yours. Please, Dr. Musa. Ya, yeah, terima kasih tuan pengurusi, um, terima kasih Dr. Arif uh, dan juga jabatan mata di uh, University di Ponorogo. It's actually a pleasure for me. I'm very humbled to be invited to be part of this uh, webinar. Um, I can see your video just was very impressive. Um, it's not easy to have a, a complete eye unit, not only with the, the apa nama, tenaga pekerjanya, tapi juga fasilitinya yang mahal-mahal. Uh, we don't even have some of your machine. The EP machine sudah lama tidak berfungsi. <laughs> okay, um, well, I was given a very, um, I would say, a very big topic. I was thinking about it for a couple of days when Dr. Arif called me and, you know, to ask whether I can give this topic on the current management of diabetic retinopathy because uh, kalau kita pergi ke conference retinanya, ya, tajuk DME sahaja didiskuskan dengan sangat mendalam and it is few days sometimes just to complete the whole discussion in all the controversies and updated things. But I will try to compress everything. Uh, if I'm going too fast, Dr. Ari, please let me know, yeah? Um, let me turn down if I have to. Uh, now, uh, 
I will try to compress everything within this 45 minutes and hopefully I will not make the audience more confused <laughs> because the, all the data is very overwhelming. Yeah. Um, now, let allow me to start with the overview of the, of the session, of the, my discussion. Um, diabetic, we can see the options of treatment for all these um, stages of diabetic retinopathy. At this particular time, we can actually intervene in almost every stages. So for this particular uh, lecture, what I'm going to do here, I will be only discuss on the treatment options when the damage is already there which means I'll be you know, sharing on uh, what is the update on diabetic macular edema, what is the updated treatment for proliferative diabetic retinopathy, and also which is hemorrhage, and lastly for advanced diabetic eye diseases. So let's go through uh, slowly with all the stages of this DR situation. Um, now let's look at the most common cause of blindness. Uh, Dr. Arif has actually give us a very good overview just now that DM is one of the common cause of poor vision in, in our diabetic patients. So they can happen at almost every stage of diabetic retinopathy. As long as they have diabetic retinopathy, they are prone to get diabetic macular edema. So these are the main bulk of patients in our own clinic. Now briefly, let's go to the pathogenesis of diabetic macular edema. 10 to 15 years back, the pathogenesis is very quite simple. All we know is DME is caused by micro-occlusion, micro-leakage, that's all. But it comes to the current knowledge, but what we do now is we know it's not only about occlusion, it's not only about leakages. So at least there are three components in the pathogenesis of DME, which is a vascular component, uh, the occlusion and also the leakage. Then we have the inflammatory component. Uh, and also we have the other one is the, the neurodegenerative process. But uh, of course, the most two important component that we can treat at the moment is the vascular component and also the inflammatory component. Uh, is my slide clear on your side? Uh, very clear. Uh, yes, I hope my, clear. Okay, because I have yeah. something wrong with my laptop this morning. I'm so worried that, you know, uh, it might not work. Okay, well, let's just revisit the traditional ETDRS uh, management uh, protocol. So, Traditionally, we always rely on our subjective evaluation of our patient. So we diagnose patient on clinical significant macular edema, or we call it CSME. So we traditionally have to measure, count the distance of the heart exudate and the swelling in relation to the foveal center. So that's what we always do. And based on those studies as well, we, what we can offer to the patient is mainly just laser treatment. So as we know, laser treatment is very slow to respond. And the only thing that we can tell the patient most of the time is we are trying to stabilize the vision. So in terms of improvement of vision is very, very minimal, uh, probably less than 10% or 10 to 15%. And the, the improvement of vision was just probably about one line or sometimes not even one line. And you can see that most of the patients say it's most of the time they would say just the vision is more or less the same subjectively. So that was the old days when laser is the only treatment that we have. So some disadvantages of the laser, as we know, although we give them probably sub threshold laser or very light laser for the macular, we still end up having a bit of scotoma at times. We may end up having a bit of CNV, choroidal neovascularization in the long run, and sometimes they have sub fibrosis. So in terms of the long-term complication is uh, very much uh, devastating in the DME cases, which we have to laser. But unfortunately, that was the only option that we have. Now, bear in mind, this is not the, there's a new type of laser that people are talking about, the micropulse diode laser. That's a different kind of laser. But I think this is not something that, you know, available in most of the country. But then uh, when it comes to laser, we are talking about more of the agar destructive laser. Micropulse is more gentle. It was found to be fairly quite good, but I will not discuss much in this knee. And, and uh, you know, not many people are using it anyway. Um, now let's go to the next topic when, you know, uh, when it comes to treatment of diabetic macular edema itself. So what options do we have? Previously we have only laser, but now we have at least four lasers and then we have anti vegf treatment. Uh, we have three available treatment at the moment and we have one new player, the Brolucizumab is coming up. Then we have steroid as one of the options. And lastly, uh, well, there is some role of surgery when it comes to uh, diabetic macular edema, which we'll discuss later. Now, what brings us to this stage of 
uh, what we're doing now with the ME cases because there were so many studies being published. It is a very interesting and fast pace. The movement of all these, the evolution of treatment for DME has been very fast. So when do we, they do all these studies from clinical trial, from the RCR net uh, studies, and also the real world study, what they're looking for is not only at the individual benefit of that medication, but they also compare between all the treatments, available treatments that we had. So which is a very robust uh, studies worldwide. Um, when we talk about all this study, it's very overwhelming. The DRCR net itself has from A up to A, B, C, D, E up to V. <laughs> you know, if you want to go through, if you go through from A to V, at the end of the day, most of the time, you're, like, you're so confused, you know, you don't know which is which and what is actually the message at the end of the day. So thank you, Dr. Ali, for this task. <laughs> so I was trying to compile everything. Uh, now, let's try to understand this concept of treatment of DME. Uh, by trying to answer these five important questions, all right? Number one, what is the best treatment uh, available? Number two, which is the best medication? Either the steroid or the intravitreal uh, antivirgef? And uh, who should we treat or what is the criteria for treatment? How do we treat the patient or how do we follow up the patient? And lastly, when do we use alternative treatment in our patients? Now, before we go further, let's just recap on the available antivirgef in the market. So at least we have, actually we have four at the moment, but the one which is widely available, uh, well proven, is the three most famous antivirgef. Number one is our Bevacizumab, which is Avastin, the cheapest antivirgef among all, but then unfortunately it's unlicensed antivirgef. Uh, uh, but then it has been used worldwide because of the, the price is very cheap, the benefit has been well proven, and the safety issues were, you know, something that almost comparable to the, the uh, Rani Bisumab. Uh, the only issue with this uh, Avastin is because it is unlicensed. And uh, that's why we always have to tell our patient, you know, that, that, that it's not FDA approved, but then it has been proven, used by worldwide. And most of the time, patient would agree to this, okay? Um, now, we have Ranibizumab, the licensed antivirgef, a smaller molecule weight, smaller fragment. And uh, then we have the fd or the ILEA. Um, uh, it's just uh, some kind of uh, virgef trap or uh, fusion protein. Uh, and the new one, the latest player, is the Brolucizumab. Uh, at the moment, uh, the, the Brolucizumab data is, is, you know, still, they have completed the phase three. The result is very um, impressive, but then there's still a bit of issues on the safety. So it is not yet uh, being, you know, people are not using it as a first line agent as for now. Uh, hopefully, in the future, Brolucizumab will be able to replace all other antivirgef because it has a longer uh, half-life uh, in the eye itself. Now, um, let's go to the first question. What is the best treatment for DME? Is laser still the best treatment or, you know, or intravitreal uh, antivirgef is now the best treatment or even intravitreal steroid? So what is the best treatment at the moment? Now, let's start with this uh, answering this question. We have to look at, there's a lot of landmark studies. So, but at least we have this top four, which is the resolve and restore. We have the rise and write, uh, um, uh, what we call the rise and write uh, study. And collectively from all this study, what it tells us is uh, at least three things. Antivirgef offers a more visual gain up to 10 to 15 letters, which is about two or three lines. There's almost like one third or two third of the sorry one third of the the snellen. Uh, Udamba injection reduces with time, so the first year you might just give them about six or seven, but the second year you might reduce to four, and the subsequent reduce to two. And then we, the studies also tell us if you defer laser treatment for this patient, is actually better in the long run. So in conclusion, it just tells us at this juncture. Uh, we are glad to know that the anti is actually far way better than giving just uh, laser treatment. Now, let's do a bit detail in the study itself. Um, in the rise and write, what it tells you, okay, well, in the rise and write, when they did the study a few years back, they are comparing the sham. Uh, that means you give patients with two different dosage of ranibizumab that is at the exploratory you know, uh, when they're trying to explore what is the best dose for the patient. Uh, obviously, you can see the big gap 
between these two, whereby with the anti VEGF, you can get almost 12 letters or 13 letters of improvement as compared to sham. Now, when we go to protocol I, will be more ethical and more relevant to us because we are using laser as our standard technique, not sham. So it can be a very busy slide, but let's concentrate on these two important lines. The, the purple line is the, the purple line is the laser treated patient and also the blue line is the running bisumab treated patient. So obviously the moment uh, you know uh, you compare with the traditional uh, treatment that we are giving to the patient, with the laser treatment patient might get like two letters of improvement, but with running bisumab you get markedly like 10 to almost 10 to 13 letters of improvement. So this is just to support the, the facts that anti reject is far more better than the laser at this current time. Now, which is the best intravitreal medication? Then we have three options for anti reject We have running bisumab, bepazizumab, and flipacept. Then uh, the next question would be, is steroid better than anti reject Because steroid has been a magic drug to treat almost a lot of diseases in our own body itself. Now, um, at least there are a few studies. Um, da Vinci is looking at Epibacept. We have Vista, Vista and Vidal. And uh, Protocol T is the one directly comparing between Avasti, Ranibizumab, and also the Epibacept. So, thank God, I would say, you know, from this particular study, it just tells tell us that all three medication is equally good for diabetic macular edema in general. However, when they do a sub-analysis, what they found is when they sub-analyze a patient into two different groups, when the patient has good vision, 2040 or better, and to a worse group of uh, patient, 2050 or worse, they found that if you give them okay, the FABCEP is the orange color line, and the uh, yellow line is the ranibizumab, and the uh, bepazizumab is the green color. As you can see, when a, in a patient with a very good vision, the outcome of the vision is more or less the same. It's comparable between all three medications. So, you know, you feel good. You don't have to go for the very expensive medication. You just can use a vaccine, everything is fine. But then, uh, when you go into a situation where the vision is much more poorer, you can see that FEVACEP uh, surpassed the other uh, anti um, In uh, With the FEVACEP itself, you can get almost 18 improvement of letters. But for the running bisumab, 14, not so bad. But when you compare with Avastin, you can only get about 11 improvement, 11 letters of improvement. So from 11 to 18, there's almost one half line. So it is a big difference. But the only issue is even for Malaysia, Avastin is very cheap, Ailia is very expensive. So if only, you know, money is not an issue. Uh, for us, usually we only, usually we, we offer those uh, Ailia long-term for insurance paying patients. So probably it's worth of having Ida if they're presented with uh, poor vision. But if not, you know, in general, they are sort of uh, equally good and comparable. Now, what about steroid and anti -vegef? Now, let's look at the options of steroid. So not only we have a lot of options of anti -vegef, we also have a lot of options of the intravitreal steroid. Mm -hmm. um, we have the transnolone, which is very cheap and available. Uh, in our country, and we have that some so in our country, but we do not have Illuvian uh, in Malaysia as for now. Now, transnol is very cheap, it stays very long in the eye. We can either put it intravitrally, or some people would, you know, be a bit skeptical and, you know, quite reserved. They don't want to induce so much of glaucoma and cataract, they, they eject the transnol osteosubtinone, although the, the outcome is not as good as intravitreal. Um, then the higher complication with transnolone is the one of the reasons that you know it was not so popular um, because the rise in IOP can be very high. We have seen a lot of patients that has to undergo GDD, a very bad outcome. Uh, they don't go blind because of diabetic macular edema, but they go blind because of complication of the medication that we're giving to the patient. So I think transnolone was not so popular back then. Uh, unless it was very, very resistant and we don't have an option. Uh, but now we have the Ozodex, uh, fairly quite expensive, um, but then it's a much safer drug. 
uh, it does give rise to a high IOP, but the small proportion of patients, just probably about 20%, and the increment of IOP was not super high compared to the transnodon. So you hardly see patients going for GDD and all sorts of things. The percentage is much, much lower, and it stays three months in the eye. Sorry about that. And then we have the fluosinolone, uh, which is the Illuvian. Uh, it is an implant which stays longer in the eye, um, but then the IOP rise was found to be much, much less. Uh, so I don't know what's available in Indonesia, but then in our country, we only have these two. And obviously, uh, that Sametasone is much more popular rather than Chamsonone at the moment. But uh, the good thing about the Dexamethasone is um, we managed to bring down the price a bit more. So, you know, we, we can use a bit lot more now because we have a big pool of patients in our center. So, we use all the Dex a lot more often nowadays. Now, uh, let's look at some of the data of comparison between the steroid and anti uh, The protocol I itself, again, uh, for this busy slide. You can see this, this study actually compared between Renibizumab and Trimstenolone. So even then, at this particular juncture, you can see with Renibizumab, you can get 12 better improvement. With Trimstenolone, it's more or less comparable to the laser treatment. So in terms of vision, I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. Just keep coming. <laughs> okay. Uh, because of what happened is the, okay, now the transistor is comparable to the laser treatment. In other words, in terms of vision gain, in the long run, there was not much uh, improvement compared to the running base of uh, However, again, when they do post hoc analysis, they were found that the, you know, uh, the visual gain is actually comparable with the anti vegetative treatment. So, in other words, when we try to conclude from this study, it says that. Steroid is probably uh, good for the pseudo patients and it's comparable. It's not bad in terms of vision, but comparable to Ranibizumab. But bear in mind, it has a slightly higher complication rate, which is glaucoma and also the. Uh, I'm sorry, it keep coming. Hmm. Uh, but it has more complication rate, uh, you know, uh, cataract and also the anti glaucoma. Now, when we look at the um, Bivodex study. Bivodex comparing between Avastin or Benfrazumab and also Ozodex. Um, this uh, slide, of, uh, sorry, this, this, this graph over here is showing about this improvement of main central macular thickness. So you can see very much uh, improvement in the terms of thickness itself, but in terms of the acuity, it doesn't differ that much. Again, this is more slightly due to the presence of cataract and glaucoma in this particular patient. So as a conclusion, we can say yes, steroid is good, but probably it's beneficial for patients who are sweet of fecky compared to those who are fecky patients. Now, who should we treat or when should we initiate such treatment? Um, this is actually a flow chart or algorithm which I take from the latest ICO guideline. Uh, published by Dr. Tian Yi Wong and his team. Um, basically, let's look at the, you know, how do we decide when should we treat the patient? If, let's say, the patient has a very good vision, and obviously there will be no central involvement of the uh, macular edema, we can still offer them a uh, laser if they have extra lesion. Of course, not at the macular, but try to laser any extra leakages if there is any, or you can just observe and just wait until there is center involvement. If there is center, central involvement of TME, the next step to do is look at the vision. If the vision is 6-6 or 2020 20, and the patient has no complaint, what we can do is we just observe and do nothing, number one. And if there is some extra formulation, yes, you probably will be able to offer some vocal or Greek. But even then, um, I think most of the patient people will agree we will try to just observe unless the heart exudate, extra foveal heart exudate or thickening it is so much and the underlying medical problem is not being controlled. But there's a room for observation in this uh, group of patients. Now, what if there's a central involved DME? That means when you do OCT, you start to see some thickening and the vision was not good. Uh, bear in mind, they even suggest that you can actually start treatment if the vision was, uh, is 
six nine. So you can actually start treatment as early as a six nine vision, and uh, probably safest to start a patient with the antivirgin therapy. Now, um, Doctor Arif has actually nicely highlighted what type of changes that we have seen before. So I don't really have to go into in much detail. But basically, what we see is uh, we see diffuse thickening. We might see some cystoid changes. Uh, we might see some subretinal fluid, hyperreflective foci from the heart and sudate or from the blood. And recently, people are talking about drill. Now, drill does not change much of our management uh, option or flow, but it, it tells us about the prognostic factor for the patient because drill sort of correlates with an area of non perfusion. So, uh, you know, these are all the osteoarthritis changes that we might be seeing uh, in our patient. So only treat the patient if the vision is poor, 6 9 or worse, and plus when there is a, a thickening of the, uh, or any changes in the uh, fovea center. Now, how do we treat that? Uh, what kind of follow-up we're going to give to the patient? When do we need to repeat the injection? And what do we do with non-responders? So even all the clinical trials have shown that at least 10 to 15% of patients do not actually respond to the antivirgin. So what do we do with this group of patients? Now let's go and answer this first question first. Once you start the treatment, what's next? You know, um, traditionally we always tell uh, the guideline is to treat the patient monthly at least a loading dose of three times, month one, month two, and month three, and reassess patient at month four. Um, but even now, People still suggest if there's continuous changes within that period of time, you just continue to inject the patient up to month six and reassess the patient thereafter. So let me just allow me just to quote one of the study which will support our decision whether we should go for PRN uh, follow up or should we go for the treat and extend follow up. Now, PRN means we have to see the patient monthly. That is an ideal situation. See the patient monthly and decide for injection once there is some changes on the OCT. Uh, treat and extend means you don't have to bring in the patient monthly, but you extend the follow-up uh, with time. And But then on every visit in this particular study, they will inject the patient. Uh, so the maximum follow-up for, the, for the patient in this particular study was just up to three months, nothing beyond that was, was at the beginning of the trial. So they don't dare to go beyond four months. Uh, what they found is the good news is whichever way you do, either PRN or treat and extend, both has equally good result. But the good thing about treat and extend, because the number of visits is much reduced, you lessen the burden of patient to come for the follow-up. Treat and extend reduces the number of visits by almost half, almost half, 40% of uh, the number of visits compared to the uh, PRN, which they have to come every month. Now, uh, so what do we do? Once we start the treatment, what they suggest is we continue the injection if there's any changes and double the follow-up once you are able to defer the injection. That means keep injecting the patient. The moment you see the OCT keep changing on every visit, keep continuing the injection until one stage you see that the OCT does not differ much compared to the previous visit, number one. Uh, and, you know, and, and, and by then, or you may want to defer the injection. But what they always suggest is, once you reach a stable OCT the first time, do not defer yet, keep injecting, bring the patient back in one month. If it's stable for the second time, what we do, inject the second time. And then on the third visit, then only you start to defer the injection. So we, we try to look at two visits of stabilization before we start to uh, extend the patient. Um, that would be the ideal situation. But then uh, when you look at a lot of algorithm, even the CPG guideline in Malaysia, instead of using the treat and extend, uh, in which you always inject the patient on every visit, they use a combination of what we call defer and extend. So you can actually extend the patient. Probably next month, you get the patient to come back two months because you're deferring the injection today. For the next follow-up, you can actually double the follow-up to make it to four months. And, you know, and, and the maximum in most of the side of guidelines is, uh, you know, you have to bring back the patient by four months for the ME cases. Now, there was a very nice study being produced again by, I think, uh, the experts from the, our, our region, 
uh, it was just published, I think, in the year 2020. Um, they have actually looked at the patient who are very much resistant. So we will go through that later. The same paper actually discussed on how to deal with uh, resistant cases. Um, we will go through in, in detail. Now, this paper is actually uh, it's a collective opinion and algorithm compilation of experts from our region, from the Asian uh, population. And it has been published quite recently in September 2020. And it has sort of helped to define certain scenarios for us to look at uh, and to assess you know, whether this patient is uh, a responder, uh, is a good respond patient, or they are actually in a non respond group. So those, how do they define this is when adequate is defined as if everything is perfectly good. That means vision is good. Uh, OCT is also good, less than 300 micrometer. Or you can see the uh, OCT changes on this visit compared to the previous visit has improved by more than 10%. So that is defined as adequate uh, response. Now, patients with inadequate response were actually a group of patients who are still receiving the first to third injection. So they're still within the loading period. But then you see the OCT changes is less than 10%. So we expect on every visit when you inject the patient, you should see the improvement should be more than 10%. If it is less within the one and two and three injection, you might want to consider, you might want to define this patient as being an inadequately responsive to the treatment. Now, the non-response group uh, will come in only after you have completed the three injections. So, you cannot say the patient is non-response unless they have completed the three injections. So, if let's say you have completed the three injection, the vision is still poor, OCT is still bad, or the OCT, you know, the improvement is very much very slow, you might want to label the patient as the non-responsive group. All right? So, what do we do with all these patients? Again, going back to the algorithm, uh, the good thing about this, it comes to a consensus. They say that if the patient is not showing good response, you did the first three months of uh, treatment, you can actually switch treatment. So you don't really have to wait for three months. Previously, we all stopped. Well, probably you wait until three months. They only switch to another antiviral jab. Or maybe some people will go for, maybe you wait for six months, you know. But now that I think people have agreed that you are allowed to switch uh, from, let's say you were using a vaccine as a start, you can actually switch to another anti-VEGF, probably running bisumab or even to ILEA, or even to steroid, you know, it's at the discrepancy of the treating doctors, but you're allowed to switch within the first three months. Now, what happened to the non-response group? You have given that three uh, monthly loading dose, vision is not good, or still is not good either. So at that particular juncture, probably patients are definite uh, non-responsive group, and they suggest you to use steroid instead, right? Uh, so this is how we deal with patients who are not responding to our treatment, anti-VEGF treatment. Now, remember the clinical trial is uh, almost a perfect kind of study. You know, they follow up the patient, they call up the patient. And of course, it's not the same as our real world situation. So um, what I'm going to share here is briefly about, you know, something we think that can we actually replicate what's happening in the cl clinical trial. So Lumina study is one of the study, a prospective uh, real world study, which involved uh, many countries in the world. Um, and it was actually, I think it involves almost 5,000 patients, including AMT and DME. And half of it actually are DME patients. So the top countries uh, contributing to the number of patients for the study is mainly not from Asian region, unfortunately. Uh, but it has uh, very big data to, to, you know, to analyze uh, the outcome at the end of the day. So if I'm not mistaken, Luminous is, look, is looking at a four-year outcome of injection. So what they found is, now remember the study says that if you give monthly injection uh, uh, for, for, for diabetes medical edema, you may get almost 12 numbers of letters of improvement. But when you give in this real world situation, of course, you know, hardly anybody will be able to give that monthly injection for one whole year. But at least, you know, you will be able to uh, give at least a, minimum, uh, a mean of 4.5 injection uh, in the majority of the country. You may still have some benefit of visual acuity. But if you see this, if you give at least five to seven, 
you will get the maximum benefit of uh, visual acuity improvement. So in other words, give at least a minimum of four injections in a year, you might get some visual improvement. If you give anything less than that, probably you might not see much of uh, changes. So it's very important to prime your patient to, be, to make them be able to actually continue the whole uh, process of uh, treatment so that they will benefit from the injection itself. Now, uh, the data also says that if you give them a loading dose, you get a higher chances of uh, visual improvement. So, of course, try, try not to skip the loading dose, the monthly uh, injection for the patient before we start to do the uh, defer and extend or even treat and extend kind of follow-up for the patient. So what did luminous conclude? They say that, you know, if you receive four injections in a year, the better chances that you are going to get uh, visual improvement, uh, at least the minimum four injection in a year. And uh, of course, better VA outcome is uh, related to those who receive a loading dose of anibizumab. And uh, again, the luminous study just support the diagnosis, the, the finding from the clinical trial, which says radimbizumab is actually uh, effective for our DME patients. Now, what else? Do we have other alternative? Uh, although we know Avacin is very quite cheap, but it has some kind of, uh, you know, unlicensing kind of issues. Antivagef is not suitable for all patients, not for those who had a recent uh, thromboembolic phenomenon, you know. Uh, do we have alternative for treatment? Alternative one, yeah, steroid. Uh, this is talking about having steroid as a first line treatment. Because traditionally, not traditionally, I think it's something that we have agreed upon that antivagef should be the first line treatment, unless, you know, in a certain situation, because steroid itself, although it's very good, but it has its own complication issues. Um, well, but we can give steroid as a first line if the patient is not responding after the initial probably three dose of antivagef, of course. Patient who could not comply, uh, not because they don't want to comply sometimes, but just, you know, they just can't come for your monthly follow-up. It's almost impossible. So those are the patients that you might want to give steroid. Pregnant women, definitely, because uh, VGF has some kind of effect, probably have some kind of potential e effect on the fetus. So we do not want to harm the mother. So you can give uh, steroid to pregnant ladies. Uh, patient with recent arterial th thromboembolic event, uh, patients who have heart acidity at the center of the fovea. I forgot to mention that from before that study shows that if let's say patient has a lot of heart acidity, um, you know, at the beginning of three to six months, you might not see the difference of the resolution of heart acidity if you give them either Ozodex or Antivagef. But in the long run, Ozodex was found to help in regression of heart acidity much, much uh, better compared to the Antivagef. So when a patient has a lot of heart acidic because, you know, having a heart acidic at the macular is something that you don't want to have. Um, this happens sometimes is that if, let's say, patients have a lot of heart acidic, extrafovial, superior especially, uh, sometimes it can happen when you give them a repeated antivagef, initially they improve, and suddenly at one point they come with a poor vision. So when you look at the findings, what happened is the, there, was, there is an accumulation of heart acidic at the macular either due to gravitation, you know, gets into the, 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 the potential space. So be very careful when you treat patients with uh, diabetic macular edema, which has a lot of heart acidity. So you might want to think about having Ozotex as one of the options. Uh, Pseudophagic patients, of course, you can actually give an option of uh, Ozotex. Uh, we try to my patient. Uh, one of the reasons is because when you give an antivagem, the half-life of the uh, medication is much, much less because it is specifically an antivitreous. And nowadays, people are even talking about combining the treatment of steroid and antivagem. So, you know, um, give us a more dynamic situation for us, to, for us to treat our patients. Now, alternative number two, we still have the laser. No, not this that we don't use laser nowadays, but we can still use them for the non-centered DME cases. Uh, patients who are contraindicated for antivagef or even steroid resistant cases. Uh, no, there's also a belief that if the patient is having such a resistant DME, one of the possible cause is the VGF is so much coming from the peripheral ischemic area. So there are some studies talking about giving a, you know, Panretinal photocoagulation, not to treat the PDR, but to treat the uh, resistant DME situation. 
uh, to ablate the uh, peripheral ischemic area and reduce the VEGF. Uh, another situation is when anti VEGF is not available, uh, financial constraint, patient can't come for a frequent follow up. So rather than not to do anything, at least we have something to offer the patient, which is the uh, laser treatment. Now, is there any role for surgery? Um, people have been exploring on this um, ever since the ETDRS uh, years. Even now, there's a new study coming up in the DRCRnet. But at the end of the day, conclusion says if they don't have a periwinkle membrane, if they don't have vitro retraction, um, retractomy has no additional benefit for this patient. So, if only they have some kind of uh, you know other pathology which could either be primary or secondary to the DME, then only the vitrectomy is beneficial for this group of patients. Not purely for resistant cases without the ERMO, BMT. Okay, we finished with the DME kind of uh, treatment management. I hope I've not confused uh, <laughs> the audience. Um, I will not be able to go into detail, but I think at the end of the day, what's important to us to know is the end or the message, the take home message of every single study and how it helps to us in managing our patient. Uh, now let's go to the other uh, sequelae of diabetic retinopathy, which is a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Well, uh, this particular patient, this particular group of patient is not the same as our DME cases because they can go blind very fast. Um, but because the benefit of anti VEGF has been seen, I mean, described worldwide about this DME for DME patients, but, uh, you know, people are also exploring whether we should just give anti VEGF to the patient and not having to laser the patient anymore. Um, a study by the DRCR Net Group, uh, when they uh, start to think about, you know, whether you can actually omit PRP, uh, they have these two groups of patient, randomized into a patient, a group of patients who actually received the ranibizumab uh, for six months and then, uh, you know, and the follow-up continues uh, see monthly for the patient and only re-inject the anti vegf if there is some sign of proliferation, really proliferation for the ranibizumab group. And another group is a patient who actually received a pan-retinal photocoagulation uh, in one to three sessions within eight weeks. And the follow-up for the PRP group was at least four monthly, not as frequent as the ranibizumab group. What did they found? At the end of the day, um, they found that if you give the injection to the patient only without having a pen retinal autocalculation, the outcome of vision is good. In other words, they are trying to say that anti vegf is non-inferior to the laser treatment that we're giving. So it's not wrong to give only anti to the patient if, let's say, you know, uh, patient thinks they are able to come for the very frequent follow-up. They don't want to have a laser done. So it is justifiable based on the study. Um, one thing different is the uh, visual field defect. When they look at five-year outcome, they found that both groups of patients, the PRP group, as well as the anti VEGF group, has continuous deterioration of the peripheral vision. However, for the patient who received anti the uh, severity of visual field loss was much, much less. So the only benefit or superiority of the anti for this group of patients is the uh, reduce in the severity of the visual field defect. Now, bear in mind, the number of injection in the running visible group they receive almost 20 injections in five years duration. But for the PRP group, they still receive some injection intermittently, but the number is only five. Um, the result was saying that ranibizumab is not inferior compared to PRP. Uh, and anti VEGF group has a better uh, peripheral vision compared to patients who receive the PRP. What else they found is patients with the ranibizumab group has less DME, less vitrectomy uh, rate. However, in patients who received a pen retinal for they still get some DME, uh, much more common than the ranibizumab group, but yet then they can still treat with the intravitreal ranibizumab. Uh, of course, they have less frequent visit and it's more durable. Now, the issue is, are you going to treat patients with only anti -VEGF? 
for all PDR patients? Is it something practical for our setup? Let's you know look at the it's like giving 20 injections in five years for the anti reject group, and you just give about five injections in the PRP group. And furthermore, to me, I don't know, I think a lot of people have sort of agreed with this that laser is here to stay in a PRP group uh, because of the durability, because of the chances that, you know, you, in case you lose the patient, you know, you don't have to worry that patient may end up with um, fast progression disease. Uh, at the end of the day, we might consider anti reject as an adjuvant treatment. You know, um, that is actually the conclusion at the end of the day on, on you know, it is up to the discussion of the, the physician. Uh, but a lot of people are talking about the combination of anti reject and parenteral photocopulation. Now, let's look at the other stage of the disease, which is a vitreous hemorrhage bleeding in the eye. Uh, again, the DRCN was trying to explore the benefit of anti uh, but it was very interesting because when they do the comparison, uh, they had two randomized groups. One group received an intravitreal injection. Another group received an intravitreal sodium chloride injection. So what they did is they gave a, a monthly injection for three months for the intravitreal group and then reassess the patient at week 12 as their primary outcome. And same goes to the intravitreal injection group. So what was the result of the study? With anti it says, well, by giving anti there's a higher chances of improvement of vitreous hemorrhage compared to the sodium chloride group by 44%. So they conclude they can, to say that you can actually give them uh, what we call uh, uh, laser PRP the moment you get a clearance of the vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, but when it comes to vision at the end of the day, um, the difference in visual equity between the treatments was observed only at 12 weeks. But when you go further at one year, the visual equity does not differ that much. That means even in the sodium chloride group or even in the anti group, both have, have equal kind of uh, level of visual acuity. Um, but yes, they conclude that even the rate of vitrectomy remains similar for both groups of patients. Now, as a VR surgeon, I am a bit reserved about this. Now, the issue is number one, because you're comparing, the study compares between anti and sodium chloride, which is not our standard treatment. You know, being a VR surgeon, me, myself, I think a lot of other VR surgeons also, we, or even medical retina people, we don't want to wait until four months, you know, um, because you know how, how our patient behave, you have to be very careful when we try to interpret what the, you know, when the study comes from the very developed country, their patients were probably the mild kind of vitreous hemorrhage. Whereas in our population, at least in Malaysia, you know, they, we have a lot more advanced diabetic cases with very bad tractional detachment. So for us, we don't want to be up to four months just to compete the, uh, and the, uh, just to complete the pen retinal photocalculation. So people are exploring the evidence whether we can just give one injection. So there are a lot of data coming up whereby, you know, even with one injection, some patients do improve. So I think one of the things, a take home message that probably we can use from this particular study is in a patient come with vitreous hemorrhage, uh, we can actually, rather than wait for the vitreous hemorrhage to resolve, what I always do is I will give the benefit of doubt, I will just give the anti reject even in the first setting. Um, because at the end of the day, if it improves, there's nothing to lose for the patient, you know. So I always give one injection and see the patient back in about three to four weeks. If the vision improves, I will keep giving the anti reject injection into the eye. But if the vision does not improve or the situation does not improve by one month, uh, definitely will send the patient for surgery. Now, when it comes to the vitrectomy nowadays, the system has been very advanced. It's micro incision, uh, risk is very low, viewing system is very good. So in other words, uh, you know, all the bad risks of, of uh, uh, you know, vitrectomy, of all days vitrectomy is, is, you know, much, much less compared to before. So it's fairly quite a safe surgery, and I think uh, the role of endovascular for vitreous hemorrhage patient is again at the discretion of the um, 
then the description of the uh, treating physician. You know, they haven't come up with any nice algorithm to suggest because there's still a lot more to explore. Now, when we look at the role of Antivirgin in the for the vitro retinal surgeon, uh, I think I would agree this is a very much a magic drug for us uh, because it does help. Injecting Antivirgin like three to 14 days before surgery help to reduce the chances of bleeding in trouble. You know, it helps to facilitate the surgery, uh, reduce the OT time, uh, less lightomy was needed, it reduced the uh, chances of having iatrogenic breaks and complication, or even the, the need to use a silicone oil. So the role of antivirgin prior to vitrectomy is, you know, uh, is actually not a question anymore. It's almost a must unless patient is contraindicated in, uh, in our own setting. Um, and thank you. That's it. I hope I've covered the, uh, you know, uh, the whole, um, what we call uh, the current concept of management for diabetic retinopathy uh, from mild to severe to advanced diseases. So those are the options that we have at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Musa for your presentation and I think this is a very nice presentation, Prof. Musa. Okay, uh, maybe there are a several questions for the resident, for Dr. For, to Prof. Musa. Mm, okay, uh, from Dr. Jeffrey. Uh, if we don't have uh, OCT facilities in our hospital, can we give a VJF, intravitreal VJF, without the OCT result, only based on telescopic examination? How about that? Any comment? Prof. Musa, please. Yeah, it's actually a very good question because I know the OCT can be very expensive. Uh, but although I understand that even in Malaysia itself, uh, our retinal society do not agree anyone to treat a patient without having an OCT because you do not have a, you know, a guideline. It's not about initiating the treatment. It's about how you are going to uh, you know, continue with the follow-up, decision-making, you want to do treatment stand, how long you want to extend the patient. You know? It's not about initiating the treatment, it's about the follow-up of the patient. Okay. Even our retinal society in Malaysia do not agree, uh, you know, if, if, if the physician has to treat uh, the patient with the OCT. But we have to understand as well, in certain situations, whereby number one, OCT is quite expensive. And if you limit that to a certain doctors, you know, the, the, the accessibility of treatment will not be in the very outreach manner. You know, uh, I think you have to balance up that um, the ideal situation, of course, we are not supposed to treat with the OCT, but I think in, in some situation, because we also do have some doctors in Malaysia who are actually in the, you know, in a remote area who actually have an anti but they don't have an OCT, you know, and they feel guilty to give laser because they know anti is yeah. much better than the laser treatment. So, you know, uh, I think it goes to the consensus. It can get consensus for the country, that would be good, yeah, but even in Malaysia, we do not encourage with the OCT. I think, you know, I, we know some of the doctors are still doing that, you know, just to help the patient. The issue is about not to start the treatment, but to, to for the follow-up purposes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Pusa, I think it was a very uh, quite clear, yeah? yeah. So, uh, I think uh, there's only, there's not only a, a treatment, yeah? So, also the uh, follow up, follow up, from, yeah, follow up from bila the mau berhenti, bila yeah. mau berapa lama mau dipanggil semula, kan? Uh, the issue is that lah, basically. Yeah, mm. yeah. thank you, uh, Prof Musa, for your explanation. I think there are uh, many question for the president. Mm, okay. Mau izin, tegar dok. Oh, okay. Pak Menteri to... tegar. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Andika, for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, Prof. Musa. Uh, thank you for the lecture today. And for Dr. Arif, thank you for the lecture. Uh, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Tegar. I'm uh, ophthalmology resident. 
I want to ask one question for uh, Prof Musa. Uh, are there still any consideration for administering administering in intravitreal corticosteroid in diabetic macular edem in eye surface in eye surf, uh, in eye surface uh, service like a primary hospital that do not have a laser treatment or anti VEGF prof or we should be to refer the patient directly to hospital or eye services that to get uh, anti VEGF or laser treatment thank you uh, I think that question is quite clear because uh, the first thing first, we, we are, again, it's not about giving treatment. We have to follow up the patient, not only about, you know, when to give the next injection, but the, you know, we have to monitor the safety profile of everything that we are giving to the patient. Um, personally, in our set, in our setup as well, you know, we always tell our doctors who are actually in a remote area, if you have Ozodex, you have, uh, well, probably Tramstolon, we, we don't encourage people to use nowadays because the, the, the sometimes patients do not, and blindness because of diabetic macular but they end with the complication of tramsinolone. And the risk of going, you know, blind from tramsinolone is very quite high. But I suppose to put Ozodex maybe, but the issue is quite expensive. You know, uh, there's definitely a role of steroid uh, if you don't have an excess of MTV You know, can even, even then, you know, you can still give laser treatment. At least something that we have to do, definitely we have to offer something to the patient and not just observing. So definitely there's a role of steroid. You can give them alone, but you just have to monitor them very regularly. Yes, thank um, you, thank you. Right? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Tegan, Prof. Musa. In our Indonesia uh, Fitoretina Society, they uh, talk about the injection without the OCT, and then they don't agree about that. They, they uh, mention that we have OCT guideline to inject the anti-VEGF uh, to manage the patient with the diabetic or edema or even the EMD. So we have to have the OCT guideline, not only for making a diagnosis, but also for the monitoring the patient. Yes. Yep. Maybe Indonesia, Fitoretina Society is the same with yeah. the Malaysia. Thank you. And there's uh, one thing that you also have to protect the doctors, you know, for the justification of giving the intravitreal injection, which has its own, you know, risk as well. Risk of endophthalmitis, risk of retinal detachment. So we have to also justify ourselves why they keep repeating the injection. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your explanation, uh, Prof. Musa and Dr. Ari. Maybe we. I have a several question from a uh, resident. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I have a question? <laughs> <laughs> do you have illuvian? Uh, what, what steroid do you no, have in no, Indonesia? No, 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 we don't have. Yes. Don't. What about yes. Ozodex? You don't, do you have no, 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 oh, no, 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 even Ozodex, yes. I see, I see. Um, yeah, we, we just started to have Ozodex for the past few years, and yeah, it's much better than, than, than Tramson. We have much less complication. It is more expensive, right? It is definitely more expensive. The price in Malaysia is about 2,700 ringgit. So, about the same price as Ilya in, in mm. our setting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, I, I want to try that, but I cannot have this Not uh, yet. Okay. drug yeah, yeah. in Indonesia. Same. Same. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe we next to the question. Uh, maybe about uh, management of DME in cataract patient. Yeah. Uh, when we'll decide to do cataract surgery and how do we decide the priority? Is it uh, the cataract surgery first or maybe a DME treatment first? And how the how does the prognosis for DME treatment to get along with cataract surgery? Thank you for your advice. Prof. Uh, I go first, Tari? Um, well, I think this is something that we have a great point that, of course, when the patient has a DME, the priority should go to the DME. Um, traditionally, what we do here, we try to inject, uh, there's no cut of point, so-called, what level of retinal thickness that you want. But we always suggest, if let's say the other eye is perfectly good and the cataract surgery is not urgent, 
the baby you can actually give the antibiotic at least for two months, two injection or three injection. You don't have to wait until it's completely dry and, uh, and just keep repeating the injection at the end of the FACO surgery as well. So after you complete the FACO, give them the antibiotic. And uh, even some people give the, the steroid, um, you know, because the chances of when you have a pre-existing DME, there are high chances you might get a cystoid changes, which might be related to cataract surgery as well. So it could be a double kind of thing at the end of the day. So of course, priority should go to DME, prime the patient for at least one or two months, and give intravitreal antivirgin during the surgery itself and continue thereafter. Uh, what is your take, Dr. Arif? I suppose in Indonesia is uh, more or less the same because it's some kind of a general consensus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do the combination? I mean, after you do the cataract surgery at the end of mm -hmm. the procedure, do you inject the maybe some anti-VGF or you do separately? Uh, at the same setting. The same setting. Same setting. Okay. Exactly. Same setting. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe in our country we still uh, we we treat the DME first until right. maybe we cannot evaluate the retina. I mean, same. the 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 obscure of the media uh, obs make us difficult to evaluate the retina, and then if the patient had a complaint about the vision, and then we do with the careful uh, management. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I next to the question. Uh, I think um, okay. Maybe they're from Doctor Samuel. Eh? Doctor Samuel asked about the. How can we defer the cause of macular edema if it's from diabetes or other causes? Is there any significant sign, maybe, from Musa or Dr. Ali? Please. Yeah, the OCT changes. That is our favorite by question, actually, for our postgraduate <laughs> student. <laughs> How do you differentiate between, uh, uh, you know, um, diabetic macular edema versus post cataract cystoid macular changes? I suppose you have to see what is more prominent in that particular OCT. If you see a lot yeah. of effective material, you know, that probably points towards cystoid because of uh, a diabetic disease. But if you see that cystoid is very quite clean, if you don't have reflective material, then probably it's more of the post-cataract surgery uh, kind of uh, OCT. Uh, Dr. Arif, anything you want to add? Because you have a very nice <laughs> OCT presentation just now. <laughs> yeah, I think it's the same yeah. uh, with you, Dr. Prof. Mm. Um, if we find, uh, you know, the sign of diabetic retinopathy inside the eye, yeah, maybe it's because of diabetes. I mean, there is a micro aneurysm, heart exudate or something. Yeah. And it's a little bit difficult to make a difference if uh, they develop macro edema because of the cataract surgery. I mean, the cystoid macro edema or because of the diabetic retinopathy. Uh, Prof. Musa, I want to ask about the management of PDR. Do you do strictly the protocol S or not? Because in my opinion, in our country, in Indonesia, I are we very afraid to let the patient go exactly, <laughs> without, exactly. without laser because exactly. <laughs> a laser will have a permanent uh, effect um, maybe just for the reducing the ischemic area, which is reduce the VEGF level in, inside the eye. So what would you think in your country? In, in our country, I mean, PRP is still the main treatment for PDR, still the same. It's just that the, we might supply with antivirgin if the patient has DME, a very florid uh, new vessel, those uh, very resistant kind of new vessel, but not as the first line. Even then, if you talk to some of the people from a developed country, they were trying to, uh, you know, the, 
sort of adapt the protocol as eventually they say that the, the, the injection is just helping you to delay the PRP. It doesn't, it doesn't sound like it can replace the PRP as for now. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Mm. But <laughs> because... Yeah. You will lose a lot of patients. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I think even in our country, we still use a pen retinal photocoagulation. It's just that giving anti regen might help you to reduce the number of PRP maybe if you use a combination. So you don't have to do so much of PRP as compared to before. And the patient has less uh, incidence of vitreous hemorrhage oh. during the period of doing the PRP. Yes. Yeah, that, that was definitely uh, something that they have found that if you give concurrently the laser and laser plus at least one anti at the beginning, you reduce the chances of patient developing vitreous hemorrhage during the procedure process. Mm. Okay. So probably combination is is the best rather than adapting the whole protocol as yes. in our situation even. Okay, we have a uh, retinal specialist in our. Our audience, maybe Dr. Afritza or Dr. Will may have a question or... Okay, uh, there are Dr. Afritza and Dr. Sati maybe, or Dr. ST. Is it... Okay. Uh, how about... Yeah, Dr. Uh, oh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Morning, Prof. Musa. Morning, Prof. Musa. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, Dr. Musa, I just, uh, I just ask you, uh, do you have still uh, performing angiography with fluorescent, and how do you apply this uh, diagnostic in the era of OCTA? Good question. <laughs> uh, not for diabetic macular edema anymore. I think a lot of our angiogram is mainly for because even even before we use angiogram mainly just to define why the patient is not responding to your laser treatment you know just to look at whether the patient has macular ischemia but nowadays with the octa uh, you can clearly see very nicely the enlargement of FAZ without the need of having uh, angiogram so to be frank i think uh, we don't really use an octa anymore uh, uh, sorry, not using the angiogram much anymore for diabetic cases, but more on the EMD and the, you know, our polyps cases. Um, so our list of angiography is much, much less nowadays. I think it comes to half in one day. We used to do like 10 or 12, you know, angiogram before this. But now I think it goes up to just four or five cases in one day. And most of them are actually EMD cases. Um, Personally, I don't see a role much in DME, except if you want to uh, highlight the issue of peripheral ischemia. You know, when patient people think some resistant kind of DME is because of the too much of ischemia at the periphery. So if you want to do some kind of targeted kind of laser, probably that's one of the role of the angiogram uh, nowadays, uh, so that you can just target that, 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 that very much ischemic area. I, I don't see much of a point of angiogram on things. Yeah, uh, really. how about uh, applying the angiogram uh, in the patient with uh, non-responsive with anti-VGF and we, we consider to perform focal or even grid laser? Do you still use the FFA? Um, because we have sort of um, adapt anti-VGF as our first line. Um, and uh, before this, no, what, what we have here in Malaysia is uh, in my own setting, because we are a semi-government institution whereby patients still pay for their treatment. So the cost of the advastate is fairly quite cheap. So most of them will be able to afford. And it's just like less than 100 ringgit for one injection. So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that, I think that is one of the reasons why we don't uh, use much of angiogram or targeted laser for macular cases anymore. Yeah, thank you, Prof. Musaf. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Afrizal. Uh, mungkin untuk teman-teman resident ya di sini yang tadi didiskusikan Dr. Afrizal dan Prof. Musaf mengenai uh, bisa nggak kita melakukan laser grid atau vokal tanpa FFA ya. Sehingga memang 
uh, eranya sekarang itu kan memang satu porsinya sudah agak sulit ya ditemukan di negara kita ya hmm. sehingga secara ideal kalau kita melakukan laser grade atau laser vokal kita harus melakukan FFA untuk melihat kebocorannya apakah kebocorannya hmm. di vokal atau kebocorannya di fuse sehingga kita ba- ba- bisa melakukan laser grade atau vokal nah era sekarang ini memang era anti VGF ya OCT salah satu dia Diagnostik penunjang yang sering kita lakukan ya karena not less invasive dan sebagainya di sana kita bisa melihat eh, apa namanya strukturnya ya kita bisa melihat eh, kelainan letaknya di mana ya secara kualitatif maupun kuantitatif kita bisa menilai dari OCT ya sehingga eh, itu menjadi suatu modalitas penunjang di era saat ini. Ya. Ya. Tadi sebetulnya uh, bicara OCT tidak hanya kita uh, treatment guided treatment saja, tidak hanya evaluasi treatment saja, tapi juga kita bisa menilai seperti prognostik pool ya dari OCT. Ya, dari kita bisa lihat dari layernya itu apakah ada ISOS yang selain yang menghilang ya RPI-nya bagaimana itu kita bisa lihat dari struktur juga di OCT. Ya, sehingga memang OCT ini suatu modal penunjang yang uh, cukup penting pada era ini, gitu ya, teman-teman ya. Presiden ya. ya. Oke, okay, uh, maybe uh, question from Dr. Desti ya. Lihat bawah, lihat bawah. Uh, do you have lihat any experience in vitrectomy patient in PDR and vitrectomy case where and find with find DMA? Should we process with anti VEGF or steroid? Consider there is no more vitreous maybe. Is there any comment? Yeah. From uh, post vitrectomy, is it for uh, the treatment yeah. of the ME post vitrectomy? Post vitrectomy. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Um, although theoretically, people say that when you do a vitrectomy, you increase the oxygenation of the macular, and uh, ideally, it should not come back. But we have seen a few cases that have a DMV post vitrectomy. Uh, anti vitrectomy is a bit controversial, but. Uh, Some of our cases, they respond very well to steroid rather than anti VEGF. I think the reason because you know the 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 uh, steroid stays for us because we use also that, so it stays longer in the eye, and uh, you know it, it seems to respond much better with steroid yeah. um, rather than the anti VEGF itself. Um, that would be my take for for post protective minus eye, but although it's quite rare, but it does happen. Okay, how, how long do you inject the anti VGF before? I mean, how many days before the vitrectomy done? Uh, to the oh, so you're talking about anti VGF before? Anti VGF before yeah. Vit- yeah, uh, for me, I would take about seven days. I used to do it just three days, but I found that they have a lot more bleeding when you have three days because although you see constriction of the or you know, but they're just not enough. Three days a bit too short, so I sort of extend it to about five and seven days, so we see a lot more less bleeding. Um, people are just up to 10 to 14 days, so I suppose the longer you keep the anti in the eye, it's actually much better. Probably not long enough, but enough to, to sort of constrict the blood vessels. Yeah. It's a very much magic drug nowadays, you hardly see any bleeding intraoperatively. Yeah. No more stress for the VR <laughs> <laughs> We enjoy doing ADD nowadays because it's very satisfying, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, before this, it was very horror. Dulu takut jadi macam selalu stress. <laughs> But nowadays, you know, it's, it's a bliss actually. It's a bliss. It's for, wonderful, wonderful. With, the, with your opinion, I mean, do you have any different patient injected by a fasten or a ranibizumab? or a fever step before the surgery, do you feel any different or it was just the same because it's just the short term of effect of the anti you mean, you mean You mean the effect What? on the intra-op finding? Yes, intra-op oh, finding. Uh, it does, it does make a lot of difference, okay. yeah. Because I remember before this, during the era when I was a trainee, I, I remember seeing cases whereby a situation whereby the doctor just open and close, you know, because there's so much of bleeding that they just cannot stop and you can't see anything. Yeah. You know, yes, um, yes, yes. nowadays I, I, was, I would say that I hardly see any cases like that. Yeah. You know, um, it's not so traumatizing and, you know, it's more within your control. So, anti is definitely a must for, for, for our patient. And thank to Abbasi, which is very cheap, although it's okay. online, I license. Yeah. Um, use it very widely. Yes. Yep. Okay. Is there any question maybe from the all 
from the all participants. Uh, and if there is, there's no question, I I, make, no. <laughs> uh, I heard that in Malaysia uh, you have already a Broly Zuma right? Broly yes. Zuma. Yes. Yes. Just by any... our show. Two weeks, ago. <laughs> Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Oh. <laughs> uh, the experience for inject. The... Uh, we are starting yeah. a study to look at. You know what Broly's is about nowadays, right? The issue is, although they marketed as you can actually extend the follow up for the patient up to four months, uh -huh. uh, but the issue is there is a small proportion of patients who end up having vasculitis, iritis. Yes, yes, yes. Uh -huh. uh, very. Oh, they, they keep saying that it's a very small percentage, but it, it's very much uncontrolled situation because you don't know what to do with this patient. Uh, what they're doing now, even, even if we listen to all the retinal talk, you know, from other countries who has been using a lot more polycystoma, it is not the first line treatment. Mm, okay. Not the first line, and not at this juncture, because uh, the company, the, the question is always that, that we always uh, hear that who are at risk of developing this vasculitis. If you can tell us that, so that we can avoid this medication to be given to those patients. So we are in control situation, rather than having, you know, uh, just by chance, you know, uh, two or three percent of your patient might end up with blind because of anti -VHF. I think that is one of the reasons that people are not using it for the first line. People probably use it for the resistant cases as for now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It is more expensive in then, Malaysia, it's the same as Ilya. Oh, the same as Ilya. The same place. Okay. okay. Um, we have a Stanfix in Malaysia. I'm, I'm not sure whether Indonesia is a Rani Bizumab, but a cheaper version. So for Malaysia, we don't use much of Ilya because our Stanfix or Lucentis is very much a cheaper. Mm -hmm. compared, it's half of the price of Ilya, what is marketed in Malaysia. So. Okay. That is one of the reasons that we don't use Alia much as compared to Ranibizuma. Ranibizuma, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I know in some country the price of Alia and Ranibizuma is about the same price. Mm. And because of that, they use a lot more Alia, but not in our situation. Cost is still the main issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I heard uh, right now just only Japan and Malaysia had the Ranibizuma, right? In Asian country, Japan um, and Malaysia. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But, because but, but people are very reserved of that. There's a lot of arguments and I think the company is having a very tough time. And I think we have a meeting because I'm, I'm part of the Retina Advisory Board for the Novartis Malaysia. So oh. we have only like, we have like two weekly meeting. Oh. Uh, you know, it's like we are trying to digest, you know, because uh. we, we want to use the medication, but we have to be very clear on the safety yeah. profile. Yes. You know, um, I think it's a good trial. It's just that we need to have more data. But they did show us the detail of patients who end up with vasculitis. When you look at the data, the patients are mainly very old. Most of them are like eight years old because they inject more in AMB cases anyway. Yeah. So, and our DME are usually quite young patients. So we were thinking, is it because they are pre-existing atherosclerotic vessel that they, you know, they end up a lot more worse, number one. Number two, they seem to have concurrent medical problem as well. So I think those are the issues that are trying to answer, you know, whether you should avoid pay, you know, this prolocism in certain group of patients. Once we get that, I think people will use prolocism a lot more. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Arif, maybe uh, from this session, uh, Dr. Helmia Farida, good morning, Dr. Helmia Farida. Uh, Dr. Helmia is the head of uh, medical doctor profession education study program. Uh, okay. Thank you for coming, Dr. Helmia. Uh, maybe from this uh, medical student, uh, is there any comment, maybe Dr. Arif? How do we correctly perform the fundoscopy examination, maybe from a direct ophthalmoscope, maybe? Is there any tips and tricks to perform okay. yeah. <laughs> yeah, terima kasih. Uh, thank you in our country di negara kita memang untuk medical student atau for the general practitioner they use the direct ophthalmoscope. They they uh, don't use the indirect ophthalmoscope. So uh, by using the direct ophthalmoscope 
we can still uh, make a diabetic neuropathy diagnosis. We can uh, examine the the appeal uh, optic nerve, and then we, we we can examine the optic nerve first, and then and we uh, you can find out is there any neovascularization there, <clears throat> and then you just follow the vessel to find out whether there is the uh, toxicity of the vein, and then after that you can examine the retina. Yes, you you have to move your direct ophthalmoscope to cover uh, area of retina because the narrow field of the direct ophthalmoscope. But still, you can see the the hemorrhage dot or blood hemorrhage in the retina. And the last, you have to examine the macular area. For the general practitioner, if you find any single sign of the diabetic retinopathy, you should refer them uh, earlier to the hospital, which is a hospital that have the ophthalmologist. Yeah. I think uh, by using the diet of the Moscow, we still can uh, make a diabetic retinopathy diagnosis. Yeah. Hopefully, it's answer your question. How about in Malaysia? Oh. Yeah, kita pun masih ajar uh, tarik of thermoscope yeah. kepada pelajar because that is our first line. Yeah. Yeah. Sama. Yeah. Jadi seperti itu ya, uh, adik-adik mahasiswa koas ya. Jadi untuk pemeriksaan fundoskopi direct ini, adik-adik harapannya bisa melakukan ya. Jadi okay. tadi yang disampaikan Dokter Arif ya, pertama kita lihat dulu fundus refleksnya ya. Fundus refleksnya kita lihat. Kalau fundus refleksnya sudah terlihat kuning cemerlang baru kita dekatkan begitu ya kita dekatkan kita lihat dulu optik nerve-nya bagaimana ada nggak neovaskularisasi baru kita geser ke arah nasal kita lihat vaskularisasi atau pembuluh darah retinanya ada tidak yang berdilatasi ada tidak yang berkelok baru kita lihat retinanya bagaimana ada pendarahan atau tidak ada eksudat atau tidak baru kita geser lagi ke arah makula di pusat penglihatannya bagaimana ada nggak yang area makula yang ketutup perdarahan atau mungkin tertutup eksudat gitu. Jadi papilla narsus dua, pembuluh darah retina, retina itu sendiri dan makula itu harus kita lihat empat organ itu di apa namanya fundoskopi direct itu harus kita lihat gitu. Ya memang ada keterbatasan di uh, ophthalmoskop direct ya karena mungkin uh, field of view-nya kurang luas begitu tapi uh, minimal kita bisa menilai. Dan kalau ada satu kelainan saja apakah itu mikromerisma, apakah itu suatu blood Uh, atau eksudat ya itu segera dirujuk uh, ke dokter spesialis mata agar penanganannya bisa lebih maksimal ya, sehingga komplikasinya tidak makin berat dan penanganannya akan lebih mudah untuk dilakukan sehingga tidak terjadi komplikasi yang lebih berat yang takutnya akan menjadi kebutaan yang permanen ya seperti itu oke okay. there are, uh, about several question maybe about vitreous hemorrhage especially in that vitreous hemorrhage How we assure that there are no traction retinal attachment because as we know that anti-VGF injection can worsen the traction. Is that any comment maybe, Prof. Musa and Dr. Ari? Yeah. Please, Prof. Musa. Yeah, that, that traction issue is probably a lot of our part of the world kind of issue. Not much for the Western world. Because when you look at the protocol, that protocol, what was the protocol? Protocol S, is it? I can't remember the name of the protocol just now. The one that <laughs> inject the anti-vegef, so many protocol. Uh, when they inject the intravitreal anti-vegef for vitreous hemorrhage patient, basically they don't look into whether the patient has tractional or not. I did ask one of the investigators at one of the conferences before, because for them, at the end of the day, they just tell you the vision is the same. You know, but... Again, I agree for our population, we have a lot more traction cases, you know, and uh, we, usually before we do an anti vegf injection, we will do a B-scan at least as a baseline. So if we see that there's uh, some amount of traction, minimal traction away from the phobia, yes, we still give. But if they say there's a traction very close to phobia, we may still give, but we just tell the patient, you might need surgery. You know. Anyway, you know, you just had a surgery anyway for the vitreous hemorrhage. You know, it's nothing to lose, but at least we prime the patient beforehand that it might not work. The traction might get worse. Then we do need surgery. Number one, 
Uh, number two is, uh, I think the issue of what we call crunch syndrome, the progression of the traction post and timber jack is a bit uh, overrated kind of thing because actually when you look in the study, they found that the chances of having that contraction post and timber jack is just about 4 to 5%. Uh, so far, I've been watching all my patients because we give timber jack for all our TRD cases before surgery. I hardly see anyone really uh, progress, to be frank. Uh, probably just one patient that progressed from a TRD to RRD from all the thousand cases that we did. Uh, but most of it does not change that much. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a bit overrated. Unless a situation whereby the traction is so much, of course, you don't want to inject in those particular cases. Minimal traction for me, I think is acceptable and fine. As soon as you tell the patient, you might need a surgery at the end of the day. Thank you, Prof. Musa, from your explanation. Mm. Maybe, Dr. Arif, you have a comment from... Yeah, uh, in my opinion, mm. if we found the traction using the B-scan, we can inject the patient, but we give the patient information about the surgery too. I mean, it's the, it's the part of the surgery, maybe. So... After yeah. we inject the patient and then we evaluate the patient if there are any worsen and then we do the operation. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Arif, for your opinion. Uh, how how about the evaluate DMA therapy and when should we process with a periodic OCT examination? Or are there any other uh, Procedure maybe, or alternative to to get that, Prof Musa. Uh, the question is how frequent is that? Is yeah, that? how frequent and how uh, OCT periodic. OCT periodic it comes with every visit of the patient. Yeah. Uh, sebagai contoh, katalah kita sudah inject sampai keadaan sudah stabil. Uh, ideally, dia ajar kita that kita kena stabil untuk dua kali visit, okay? Dua kali tengok OCT ni agak berubah, tak, ber, tak berubah. So, okay, kita, then from then, we start to defer the injection. Kita panggil patient datang baik dua bulan. So, we can double the follow-up. Mm. Okay, so, pada tempoh dua bulan itu, of course, kita kena buat OCT lah, ya. Yeah? And then, datang lagi pada tempoh dua bulan, OCT dia sama. Then, kita bawa kepada empat bulan. So once the reach four months, what we do is we just keep bringing the patient back at four months. Uh, there's no guideline of how long you can bring it then, but then usually at this juncture, we still bring our patient back at four months, unless it's very, very dry after three years. So empat bulan is usually our sort of maximum cap for DNA. Okay. Patient, yeah. Thank you, Prof. Musa. All right. Maybe for the audience, is there any question for to Prof. Musa or Dr. Alif? Uh, I just make a little bit. Uh, comment about yeah. the treat and control just like you said we don't do the treat and extend but treat and control treat and control yeah after we treat and then we control if the patient has the stable condition and then we extend the time the yeah. timing of evaluation right. and if when the patient come back with the active sign Right. We do the injection and then we reach huh? back to the one month. One month, yep, yeah. Yep. In, in, in my opinion, Correct. Yes, one yes. month again and then we evaluate one month. If get better and then we can make a longer, longer. evaluation by two weeks and ever, or one month after yep. that. So maybe in our country, it may a uh, little bit help because of the huge number of patients, something. Yeah. 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 And some of the patients are very worried to get injection, even though they already had many times of injection. Yeah. In the treat and extend uh, regimen, 
they already preparing themselves to get injection when they go to the hospital. I, yes, right. I saw the face of the patient. <laughs> I will be very, very surprising when patient, yeah. even some of our patients, actually, when they get used to the injection and they know the benefit, yeah. sometimes when we say, no, hari ini tak perlu, tak perlu injection, they will still like, macam marah, you know? <laughs> Why not? I'm supposed to get the injection. And then, no, you don't have to, you know? But you know, some, some patients can be very yes. interesting because they see the benefit. Yeah. I agree, some patients juga takut. Yeah. 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 Benar. Okay. Uh, maybe Prof Musa in Malaysia, you perform the injection in operating room or in a clean room or in the clinic, just in the clinic. In the clinic. Yeah, in a, what we call a clean room, clean room. Clean room. Clinic. Yes, yes, it's clean room in the clinic. Because we have like 30 to 40 injections in one day, so we cannot afford to bring everyone to the OT. We have more money for us, but <laughs> it's just a long, it's a long list. So, um, so far we have been doing it. In, in. The, the, the resident is actually helping us with the injection. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, mungkin saya punya pendapat hmm. sedikit mungkin ya teman-teman yeah. resident ya. Jadi kalau kita melakukan injeksi Intravitreal ya, mungkin kita belum ada clean room seperti itu ya, ruang yang betul-betul bersih itu clean room sehingga kita perlu melakukan di ruang operasi gitu operasi. ya. Kita yeah. lakukan di under operating mikroskop gitu, karena yeah. kita jika pada saat kita melakukan injeksi intravitreal memang uh, kita memasukkan apa namanya suatu obat begitu ya, akan menambah hmm. volume, kita perlu periksa dulu tekanan bola matanya seberapa gitu ya visus yeah. dan juga fundus. Kalau tekanan bola matanya tinggi, yaitu kita memang uh, apa namanya kita lakukan parasintesis ya under operating mikroskop ya sehingga memang penting sekali untuk kita melakukan injeksi di VGF itu under operating mikroskop. Tekanan bola mata tinggi kita bisa parasintesis on site begitu. Tekanannya agak turun baru kita masukkan obat ya seperti itu. Jadi uh, memang kalau saya sih mungkin uh, lebih prefernya kita lakukan di di, di operating room ya. ya. Yang lebih bersih. Lebih bersih. <laughs> Dokter Arif, maybe is there any comment? Dokter Afrisa atau Dokter Satya, maybe? Dokter Arif? Can be done in the operating room or the clean room like uh, like the other country. Yes. Uh, as long as we follow the aseptic condition well hmm. maybe it is okay yeah okay. thank you dr arif prabusa for your opinion uh, maybe is there any question maybe for from the audience the ophthalmology resident and uh, medical faculty maybe Teman-teman koas atau teman-teman residen, ada yang mau ditanyakan lagi mungkin? Ada lagi? Ada lagi? Uh, ya, untuk medical student ya, semua pasien dengan diabetes okay. retinopati terutama yang tipe 2 itu harus diperiksa fundusnya pada saat kita mendiagnosis diabetes mellitus karena kita tidak tahu itu sejak kapan pasien itu menderita diabetes ya setelah itu kita tinggal melihat kalau memang ternyata belum ada tanda-tanda ya epidemiologi ya kita bisa follow up untuk uh, matanya untuk fundoskopinya itu mungkin selama enam bulan atau satu tahun ya tapi kalau sudah mulai ada tanda-tanda ya itu segera saja dirujuk ke rumah sakit terdekat ya jadi kalau tipe 2 begitu terdiagnosis periksa matanya ya fundoskopinya jangan lupa ya jangan sampai terlambat nanti karena tadi disampaikan kalau udah terlambat kita sulit untuk mengembalikan lagi penglihatannya ya. 
Jadi itu ya uh, yang perlu diperhatikan oleh uh, medical student ya dengan atau nanti sudah menjadi general practitioner ya. Yeah. Jangan lupa matanya. Jadi kalau kita ngobatin diabetesnya terus 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 tanyakan penglihatannya ya, matanya bagaimana ya. Mungkin kita tadi sudah sebagai kompetensi dokter mata umum untuk menggunakan direct ophthalmoscope ya, pergunakan itu untuk men-screening ada atau tidaknya retinopati diabetika. Ya. Mungkin itu dokter Andika. Ya, ya terima kasih dokter Arif ya. Jadi memang uh, pesan dokter Arif ya saya dan juga staf uh, pendidik bagian mata ya bahwa diabetes retinopati ini angkanya cukup tinggi sehingga adik-adik koas ini harapannya saat menjadi dokter umum itu bisa melakukan penemuan kasus lebih dini ya. Tadi tanda-tanda klinis sudah disampaikan dokter Arif ya. Tanda tanda awalnya apa saja ya itu sehingga harapannya jika adik-adik bisa menemukan kasus lebih cepat bisa menemukan kasus lebih dini lebih awal kita bisa tangani lebih cepat sehingga harapannya progresi kita sih tidak makin berat ya tapi juga jangan lupa bahwa penanganan eh, diabetes ini memang komprehensif ya jadi jangan lupa lihat matanya jangan juga, jangan juga lupa untuk pengendalian golanya dietnya olahraga ya eh, fisiknya dan sebagainya juga tetap perlu pertimbangkan penyakit-penyakit komorbid lainnya, darah tinggi juga perlu dikontrol, gula darah, kolesterol, dan sebagainya juga kita perlu pertimbangkan juga untuk selalu dikendalikan. Ya, sehingga harapannya penanganan kita bisa lebih maksimal, bisa lebih komprehensif, dan uh, pasien akan lebih sehat. Gitu ya. Oke, okay, uh, is there any question maybe for the audience? And Dr. All Andi. Oh, oh, please. Please, Dr. Fatima. Ya, Dr. Fatima uh, is a staff in ophthalmology department. Please, Dr. Fatima. Good morning, Prof. Uh, I am Dr. Fatima. Uh, may I ask about, uh, is there any protocol changes during this pandemic? And what about the telemedicine practice in retinal service uh, in Malaysia? Thank you. We have been trying to do telemedicine for quite some time, but it was not easy. <laughs> uh, uh, they did try in the Ministry of Health, but uh, uh, and train a few people for screening purposes. Kita uh, latih um, our because in our facility, Ministry of Health, kita ada klinik klinik kesehatan. Uh, kita sudah letak banyak. Uh, what we call a uh, pandas camera the all uh, clinic clinic kesehatan untuk membantu screening process so they do their yearly screening hanya di klinik kesehatan tidak perlu datang ke jumpa doktor mata number one so telemedicine kita pernah mencuba but as far as I know um, it's still at the baby stage kind of thing in terms of uh, practical wise um, uh, the platform ni ada tapi belum uh, di-establish banyak di, 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 di Malaysia. Uh, but we are actually training a lot of people to help with our screening process. Um, uh, you know, uh, the, the optometrists, the nurses, the MAs, actually certified people to do the screening. Uh, the next question about this, what happened during the pandemic region? Um, there was a discussion about this pandemic thing. Uh, in Malaysia per se, uh, we sort of um, we have no choice but to uh, you know um, in in TME probably it's not so bad as compared to EMD. You know, missing one injection of antibody jab is not as crucial as EMD active cases. Even in DME, you have the role of observation. So in our setting, patient with DME, we tend to sort of uh, you know prolong their follow up. But for AMD cases, the active AMD, we try not to because we know they are very sensitive to the you know, this issue of bleeding and stuff with the quick. But for DME cases, we try to sort of prolong the, the antibiotic injection. But in our center at the moment in Kuala Lumpur, we, uh, from, we, we, we still receive at least half the number of patients. So, you know, the service is still ongoing at the moment. We don't completely close it down. I know in some country they even go for outreach. There are some country I think in can't remember in which country was that that the doctor actually goes to the patient's house to give injection. You know until that stage, uh, uh, but 
you know, I, I don't think you don't really have to do that, you know, as as long as you, you keep track of all the patients. Um, and it, in our centre, you know, they still get their injection as for now. They still get all priority. Thank you, Professor. Is there any question, maybe, from Thank Dr. You. Fatima? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so the fundus camera that uh, given by the government for nowadays is used for, for screening. Screening, screening oh, correct. Not for the follow up and the follow up as well. And the follow up. Oh, and the follow up as well. Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you. For yeah. The follow up patient who uh, know the R stage. So the moment they see some changes, they will send the patient to the uh, oh, high clinic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Prof. Musa, for your explanation. Is there any question from audience? Okay. If there are not any question, maybe we are come to the last discussion. We would like to say very, very thanks. Thank you, to Prof. Musa, for your lecture, for your explanation about. Uh, diabetic retinopathy and also Dr. Arif Yildan. Maybe hopefully the this oh the discussion will give a benefit for us and thank you for your kind attention. See you later, Prof. Musa. Thank you. Thank stay you. safe. Thank you, Dr. Andika. Thank you, Dr. Arif. Thank you. <laughs> stay healthy. Stay safe, Prof. Right. Thank you. Yeah, we'll make a photo. We we'll make a photo oh, first. Photo first. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was trying to look for our photo, Dr. Arif. I get to <laughs> we first met in Singapore. Remember, it was ten years ago. Yeah, yeah. Mana fotonya? Tidak jumpa. Dr. Arif is a uh, is our you know we have met like 10 years ago okay, in Singapore and then back in yes. Germany, Germany. That was and yeah, and if we are, if we, if we are TS, yeah. Yeah. yes. Okay. It's a very good moment in our training process. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. Who you want to take the okay. picture? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Prof. Musa. Yep. Uh, what do I have to do? Uh, Stop the screen. Uh, stop, uh -huh. stop, stop, uh, stop sharing. sharing. Oh, okay. Uh, stop, yeah. stop oh, sharing. I have to stop sharing. So, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, for the all the audience, please make the video on. Okay. Yeah. Terima <laughs> kasih. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed the session. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Dr. Musa. Thank you for your join with us. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Kapan-kapan kita undang lagi ya. Ya, ya. Ya, virtually. Datang ke Kuala Lumpur pula. Okay. Ya, terima kasih. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Terima kasih. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.